like to welcome you to today's virtual uh, Spark ACRL forum, uh, the first virtual forum that we've had uh, that is one in uh, a series of many uh, forums that we do with ACRL's Reset Committee uh, at ALA Annual and ALA Midwinter. And at the top, I'd just like to thank uh, the ACRL uh, Reset Committee, and in particular, Aaron Owens and Mel Desart, uh, who were you know, instrumental in helping get this forum uh, together and put in a lot of work uh, to bring uh, the, today's forum uh, to you. So thanks so much, Mel, Aaron, and the, the rest of the Reset Committee. Uh, so we are recording uh, today's discussion, so just be aware of that as you're asking questions or making comments in the chat that those uh, you know, will be captured in the recording. Uh, and then finally, we would ask that folks uh, ask questions using the Q&A functionality that you'll see in the, the bottom menu under the speakers uh, and use that to ask questions. You should also be able to upvote questions or even comment on others' questions, uh, assuming Zoom is working the way that we've uh, intended it to. Um, so again, use the Q&A function for questions, uh, and we'll be monitoring those and hope to, uh, you know, hope to, to address those as they, they come up. Um, as we mentioned in the announcement, this is really intended to be a facilitated discussion. So, you know, no long individual presentations. It's really meant to be a conversation. Uh, and we, you know, would really welcome uh, your engagement throughout, um, you know, with questions and comments. So uh, again, use the, the Q&A function for the questions. Uh, and then you can use the, the chat function, uh, which you can also access um, through that bottom menu bar uh, to make comments or to share your own uh, personal experience related to the conversation that's happening. That, that isn't a question. Um, and so uh, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to, to Heather for some opening remarks before we, we kick things uh, off with the panel. Heather. Great, thanks so much, Nick. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, and thanks again, I echo Nick's uh, um, appreciation for your patience as we had to reschedule due to the power outages. Um, thrilled to be able to be part of uh, the ACRL Spark team that's bringing you this forum today. I, I logged on a few minutes ago and just seeing the panelists, I, I popped off with a you know off the cuff comment of this is like a dream panel. Could you all just stay with us forever? Um, really feel grateful to have you all together uh, to share your insights, um, especially now, you know, when we're going through a time of such deep uncertainty and upheaval um, as a community and as a society. Um, it's causing us really to not only reevaluate our day to day operations, but also, I mean, really to think deeply and revision our priorities and criti real, really critically question where it is that we want to go and put our resources and to what ends do we want to to invest those resources the more you know the deeper we get into this the more we recognize that there's no pandemic ends bright line right where the world kind of goes back to normal and we go to business as usual and nor do i think we want to go back to business as usual which is kind of the point of this forum um we're in the midst of, uh, of, of, of so much uh, more profound of a set of changes from the combination of the pandemic, economic uh, uh, upheaval, um, racial justice issues. Uh, I mean, we really have, I know the, the Democratic National Convention used for a major and they added climate change into uh, the midst, which is, which is true. I mean, thinking about the way the way we'll change, the way we do our work going forward, all of these things kind of come into play. And they're pushing us to fundamentally rethink how it is we want to move forward. And it really has created, you know, kind of a once in a generation opportunity for us to take giant steps forward towards insisting on a scholarly communication system that truly centers openness and equity at its core the business decisions that we each individually make and collectively make today um, as to how we choose to invest the billions of dollars we're responsible for as a community in stewarding will have both immediate and long-term impacts on what this system looks like and i'm really looking forward today to spending time with uh, the speakers that we have uh, here um, online and of course, all of the rest of you who are taking the time out of your schedules and your busy lives to join us online, to have a conversation um, about ways that we can most effectively drive forward together towards this end goal. 
So I really do encourage you all to be as active in the conversation as possible um, at, uh, and spark an ACRL. We really do value the discussion with the community. And again, um, we're delighted to have the chance to have this really important conversation with you all uh, together today. Um, and with that, I believe, Brandon, you are up to take over the program. And thank you again for agreeing to moderate, Brandon, and great to see you. You bet. Thanks, Heather. Uh, it's good to see all of y'all. Um, so thanks, everyone, for joining us today, all ooh, 411 of you and counting. Um, I'm confident this is going to be a really uh, compelling conversation. Uh, I'm Brandon Butler, the Director of Information Policy at the University of Virginia Library. For the last several years, I've been working with the seven state-supported research libraries in Virginia to rethink our relationships uh, with the biggest academic journal vendors and especially the big deals that capture a majority of, uh, of our collections. And like many of you, and I'm sure including our panelists today, uh, we knew years ago that this status quo is unsustainable. It is not ideal. Um, these kinds of deals, they cost too much. They're a weird mix of things that some people really love and things that almost nobody even reads. Uh, and half of what people do read is available legally for free now. Uh, and that proportion is only going to grow and at an accelerating rate. Uh, so in short, the value of these really expensive deals is in decline while the price is sort of continuing to go up and up. Uh, our past negotiations have gotten really bogged down in that kind of spaghetti splatter complexity of uh, legacy pricing models. And, um, and uh, <laughs> we struggle to get through those. Um, uh, and at the end, we just feel even more out of control, right? Um, well, uh, and what else is new, right? I could have given that little intro about 10 years ago, um, but I think we know that a lot else is new now. Um, suddenly, Essentially, every library has a mandate uh, from our institution and even from our state uh, to rebalance things, uh, to rethink our spending, uh, and in many cases, quite dramatically and on a very short time scale, uh, with no restorations in sight, right? Decisions that once may have seemed sort of discretionary are starting to look downright obligatory. Uh, the patience and sacrifice, uh, the shifting expectations that we would have to ask for folks as we make these different changes um, seem like they may hardly register as wave after wave of change is crashing over our faculty, uh, our students, and other constituents. Campus leaders who in good times might have hesitated uh, about making big change um, are suddenly probably a lot more interested in proposals that show, um, that show meaningful reform from our past ways of doing business. Um, tools like Unsub have turned our kind of anecdotal suspicions that we might be uh, not getting such an awesome deal into kind of a detailed dashboard uh, that shows us exactly which journals we are needlessly buying and which ones we could get for cheaper through other legal ways. Uh, and I'm not going to lie, you know, the silver lining to all of this uh, rather dark stuff that's been happening lately is that at least there's a lot of campus alignment in favor of rethinking what and how we buy. Uh, but we also know we can't just cut our way to a better future. In an austerity environment, the strongest and most established participants tend to survive and even emerge stronger, and competitors uh, can wither, and our institution's capacity for experimentation, innovation, and risk-taking can shrink. Uh, so the metamorphosis we need in scholarly communication will be kind of halfway done once we've cut all the things we don't like uh, and all the models that aren't working but it won't be finished until we've built something else, right? And so the real trick is to know which are the things to cut and which are the things to build um, and to marshal the courage that we're all gonna need um, to start making those kinds of hard choices. And we couldn't have asked for a better panel of discussants uh, to help us find the guideposts we need to make sense uh, and maybe even make use of the crisis, uh, the crises that are rocking our institutions right now. Um, keeping an eye on the long-term consequences of the choices that we're all facing right now. So uh, let me say a little bit about each of them and then I'll let them talk most of the time from now on, I promise. Um, Chris Borg is the director of the MIT Libraries and is well known for her leadership on equitable and open scholarship. Under Chris's leadership, the MIT Libraries have helped cultivate an enviable level of campus buy-in and support for open access and open science, uh, including, I can because I envy it, um, including the development of the MIT framework for publisher contracts, 
uh, which has garnered endorsements from a number of other libraries and library groups, including mine. Uh, MIT recently ended its negotiations with our friends uh, at Elsevier, citing the publisher's failure to offer terms consistent with their framework. John E. Cawthorn is the Dean of the Wayne State University Library System and describes himself as pathologically positive. John has experience making tough but smart decisions about investment priorities. Uh, he led West Virginia University through a series of subscription unbundling efforts, all the while leading an expansion of the institution's investment in open publishing and creating what has become the ACRL Diversity Alliance Program, a group of 44 member libraries which he now chairs. In a forthcoming article, John suggests that we can take some inspiration from the pace of social change we are seeing now, and we can learn to be more courageous in demanding change in scholarly communication. I hope we'll talk a lot about that today. Scarlett Galvin is the collection strategist librarian at Grand Valley State University, an institution with a rich history in scholarly communication. Most recently, GVSU issued a strong statement on the intransigence of many leading textbook publishers who refuse to sell electronic books to libraries. Their strongly worded statement names names and pulls no punches, describing a broken system that, quote, sends taxpayer funded student financial aid back to content providers who further exploit faculty labor and research to monopolize and dominate knowledge production. I, I love it. Um, and then finally, last but by no means least, Caitlin Faney is the Executive Director of Invest in Open Infrastructure, which aims to support decision makers in aligning their investments with their values. IOI's efforts have already grown at a remarkable pace from just 16 initial partners to over 80 participants in, in their initial uh, surveys and conversations. Caitlin is investigating the common needs and friction points among institutions like ours who are struggling to make our budgets reflect our principles. But for taking the helm at IOI, Caitlin built and scaled infrastructure, programming, and long-term funding for organizations like Creative Commons, Digital Science, Mozilla, and most recently, the Wikimedia Foundation. So we're in for a fun ride here, y'all. And I'm gonna start with a very big picture question uh, for everyone, and we'll uh, uh, we'll go in that order that I just introduced you in. So, Chris, I'll turn to you first. Um, to start us off, I wonder if each of you could say a little bit about generally how you're experiencing this moment um, and the stakes that you see at sort of the highest level of abstraction for your work and for the library and research community as we navigate this kind of confluence of crises? You know, what are the attitudes and orientations and approaches uh, that you think are gonna be needed to kind of persist through these tough times? And so Chris, I'll turn to you first. All right, thanks so much, Brandon. And thanks to uh, ACRL and Spark for putting this together. Um, it really is a dream team. I, uh, I, I wanna keep my remarks uh, short so I can hear what my wonderful <laughs> colleagues on this panel have to say. Um, and thanks to all of you all for tuning in. So, I, I mean, I think that's a great big picture question to start us off with, because I do think we are, um, you know, we're in the middle of, of a confluence of, of many different, several different kinds of crises, right? Um, some of them new, right? I mean, obviously we're in the middle of a uh, pandemic based on a new virus that we don't quite understand yet. Um, but some of the crises that are intersecting with that are actually really long simmering and well known to many of us, right? Um, but they are, the pandemic seems to have laid some things out in stark relief for us. Like we can't ignore them or pave over them uh, anymore. And so just, I mean, we all know this, but just so you know what I'm talking about, um, what I'm talking about there is, I mean, systemic racism is not new it's not even necessarily getting worse. It's just that it's getting filmed, right? And more people, and by that I mean mostly white people, um, are becoming aware of the you know, hundreds of years of oppression um, that black people have been subject to in this country. Um, I think we're also seeing other kinds of persistent and pernicious inequalities um, have become much more obvious through the pandemic um, and I'll talk about that a little. I hope we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and then, you know, uh, 
as the majority of higher education goes has went remote like really abruptly right um we saw um all these inequalities that we across at least higher ed right that we all know about but we kind of don't talk about they become became really obvious and like the band-aids that we put on them like became ineffective right and a lot of those band-aids we do at the library level right so we band-aid over as libraries um, all kinds of uh, digital divide kinds of inequalities by providing computer clusters um, all kinds of socioeconomic inequalities by providing course reserves for students who can't afford to buy all of their books right so all of those things became, um, we couldn't do that anymore. And so those inequalities bubbled up to the surface in a way that we, in a way it's almost, um, I don't know, there's, there's a, a way in which we simply cannot ignore it anymore. And, and the fact that we are going, we have no choice but to face those head on and be honest about them is at least a good thing in terms of the honesty and the, we have to face them. Um, and then, you know, on top of that is this financial uh, crisis that intersects with a public health crisis. Um, and as, uh, you know, Brandon has laid out for us, we're in the middle of the, you know, serious um, financial strain that's been there for a while, but really got uh, much more difficult. And, you know, as someone on the panel speaking from one of the elite institutions, you know, I have to be honest, I, of course, those financial strains are felt unevenly across higher ed. Um, okay, so all of that big hand wavy, what's going on, all the crises that everybody already knows about, but that's kind of how I'm thinking about them and what's on my mind. And um, for me, right, I think we all know that, um, you know, whatever questionable utopian vision that the internet would be this great equalizing force, um, you know, it, it, it was never really, um, uh, a vision that many of us brought it bought into to begin with, but even so, it certainly didn't come to any anywhere close to fruition. Um, and yet, and, and and yet, this pandemic may be sort of our cross the Rubicon moment, right? Um, with this abrupt, massive global shift to online learning, education, and teaching. And as Heather says, we're not going back to the old normal. Like we know that much of this is gonna, much of what we do is gonna remain remote for a very long time. Um, and certainly even when we do go back, it'll be more, um, uh, more will be remote than used to be. Um, all that is to say like all of that, all of these crises and all of our thinking about sort of the fact that we're, there, we're not going back to a, an old normal um, one of the ways that me and my leadership team have thought about this was that we developed a document we called um, the MIT Library's Vision, A New Urgency. And I just want to share a little bit of what's in that and then turn it over to my other panelists, right? So in, in our statement about our, our vision and the new urgency that we're feeling, two things we committed to were being a digital first library and prioritizing an open scholarship agenda that accelerates the progress of science, promotes equity and inclusion across disciplines and across uh, peoples, and reduces marginalization of scholars and scholarship from disadvantages, disadvantaged communities. Um, so that's kind of, uh, I mean, I've got more to say, but I'm, I've already talked too much and wanted to hear from my, my other panelists, but that's sort of what's really sort of focused our attention on digital first and open science. This is our moment. This is our cross the Rubicon moment. So I'll turn it over to the next speaker and I know we'll come back to some of these themes. Thanks a lot, Chris. Yeah, John, if you could take it from there. Yeah, you know, Chris, I could listen to you all day long. It's really a pleasure to be on this panel with you and all the people. And I wanna thank all of you for sticking with us to do this panel again. Um, I want to frame my comments since Chris took a really broad brush at how, uh, you know, our, our society has changed and how higher education has changed. I want to really drill down into our organizations and kind of what we're experiencing. And I appreciate this question very much because one of the things I think that we all have to kind of contend with is this idea of how we deal with fear as we go forward. How do we think about the 
ways that we address fear in, in, in the way we built our, our decision-making structures, our organizations, and uh, the way we provide uh, collections to the campus. And I have a couple of examples for that, so um, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that. I also think that instead of thinking about maybe the journals that exist, maybe we can think a little bit broader about maybe even directions that higher education was going uh, initially. I mean, we, we, we've seen a lot of hiring of interdisciplinary faculty on, on campuses all over. Mine is, is very much, but what, what is that experience for interdisciplinary faculty and how do they get promoted with tenure and the structure that we have and maybe our role as, as libraries and as real leaders on the campus and all things scholarship, uh, that we, we actually are uh, beginning to think about interdisciplinary outlets or journals that could be created. I think this is a really important uh, area for us to think about and begin to work on. And I also think that, you know, we'll talk more about this during the, dur during the session, but I think that higher education itself is under tremendous, tremendous pressure and I think that libraries could do more than just, and, and this is just for shorthand, <laughs> uh, don't, don't start any rumors now, this is just shorthand. I'm saying that if we have our hand out only, if we have our hand out only for the amount of funds that we need to operate our libraries and then turn around and give it back to vendors, that that might not be the best way to think about designing a new way of operating and that we maybe even think about uh, building in new cost structures or building new things that could add to higher education. Now, I know that's a little bit of a, that's a bit of a wish list kind of thing for me is how can we really help higher education innovate and think about new ways to bring value. But I can share some ideas about what we're doing at Wayne State uh, in that respect. I, I just, uh, in, in answering the direct question, I think that when, this whole pandemic happened, I was thinking about fear and the amount of, of energy we put around fear that actually keeps us keep thinking about the organizations the same or, or keeps us from not, not doing innovations like we really should think about. And I, I often said to our team, like, where does a new idea go in, in our library? I mean, who, who has an idea? That's, that's one question. But where, if we, if we heard a new idea, if we heard a new idea, what would happen in our organizations to that idea? And honestly, it would, it would, not, get, it would not get a really good uh, uh, listen to, probably. Uh, and, or, or if it did, it got some comment like we, we, we've heard that idea 15 years ago. And you know, colleagues, if we, if, if we come with the same kind of perspective in this new pandemic, we, we are really gonna limit our ability to be innovative. And so that's what I really wanna kind of pound home, this idea that we have to really, really deal with fear and get at the underlying things that, that drive fear and so that we can get the innovation because we can't be innovative or creative if we're fearful. And, you know, I'm, I'm the dean of the School of Information Sciences, and even our profession uh, had some worries about uh, being obsol obsolete, you know, in, in the services that we provide or the way we provide our services. But that doesn't mean that we, we don't have what people need. We have what people need. It, the, the challenge is us and kind of how we can begin to rethink the, the way we might be able to recast that value because we, we care about reading and knowledge and facts. And I, you know, I say all the time, we're just in a season where those things may not be uh, seem like they're, they're, they're important, but they actually are. And that's not a political statement. It just is a, it's just a fact. We're in a season and we'll be in another season. Our, our profession is gonna be here in 2021 and 2031 and 2041. So this is a moment right now where we can begin to think about uh, ways that we accept new ideas, ways that we think about how fear has impacted our ability to make decisions. And that goes for vendors. I understand there's vendors on this call. And so th there's a lot of fear uh, based on how, how you've brought the products to us as we buy them. You know, you haven't really worked together 
to create products that we uh, ha have a, had a part in. So we just we, we show up you know, and then we, we were ready to buy the products. And as, as Heather mentioned, we have billions of dollars, okay? So this is not like the money is not running out of town. It's going to be here. So maybe we can just kind of take a breath. And I appreciate this panel so much because that really, it, it really is an opportunity to take a breath and say, what are the, what are the really valuable things we have? And I know that we have tremendously smart people in this profession. I'm amazed every day at not only the people that I work with in the libraries at Wayne State, but you know I, I have a great institution in Ann Arbor uh, that, 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 that just so happens to be in my state that also has a bunch of really smart people. And there's smart people in this profession. And I think if we, if we frame the questions the right way, and we're very kind to ourselves and not thinking that we have to be perfect because colleagues, we thought we had to be perfect before. And it took us 18 months to come up with one idea in the library. Let's not do that. Let's, let's create a culture that's more innovative and, and, and more able to think, think fast on, on its feet, fail fast, in other words. So I'll let my colleagues go on, uh, and, and I appreciate very much being asked to be on this panel, and uh, thank you, Brandon, for the time. Yeah, absolutely, and so now we've heard uh, two perspectives from the, the top of the library hierarchy, but uh, Scarlett, I wanna hear from someone who's doing work in, the, in, in making things happen. Uh, not that you guys don't work, Chris and John, I know you work very hard, um, but you know, uh, a different it's perspective, a, di <laughs> a different perspective on how to weather these times from where you are, Scarlett. What's working for you in looking at what's what's sweeping over our over your campus and 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 you know persevering in the face of it? Sure. Um, can you hear me all right, Brandon? Yes. You're okay. Great. Good. Just making sure. Exciting times with a new mic. Um, so. Uh, uh, from my perspective, uh, the, the confluence that uh, Brandon and all of the panelists have discussed is a question of what the role of the library is in communities that we're part of and how that's going to play out in the future. Um, and, and within that giant statement are a number of, of difficult questions that if our organizations don't have the capacity to confront them, will mean that they meet those challenges that we're experiencing exclusively from a place of fear and reaction. Uh, when we can gain uh, enormous ground uh, in this moment, uh, especially when it comes to uh, collection cuts um, or uh, any kind of more significant limitations that are being placed kind of uh, on our systems. We can uh, position ourselves as the experts we are. I think it, this really varies from library to library um, and that will have an effect on how it plays out. But we have an opportunity to gain authority and agency over our collections and services and really position ourselves as, as the experts. Again, that it's not just a book warehouse. Um, so one of the unfair trades I think that uh, library leadership ages ago, because we've, we've known that big package deals were a problem since the 90s, there's literature that goes back explaining that. One of the un unfair trades that we've made in signing on to those wasn't just about savings that we've mostly debunked with either in-house bibliometrics pro projects from folks in positions like mine and tools like Unsub, but we've left unfilled or otherwise transferred the many positions and skill sets that are required now to maintain data sets and systems and relationships and connectivity between platforms that make all of what we think of as the library, especially in a remote environment, what we think of as the library, um, you know, functioning. Uh, it's, it's interesting that, you know, John has invoked infrastructure a couple of times, I, and we have so much enterprise infrastructure in libraries that it shouldn't be, you know, popsicle sticks and chicken wire and duct tape. And yet, here we are, you know, with things that have tremendous discovery problems still and, and issues with metadata and, and underlining, uh, underlining search and, and findability. Um, so, so now we have libraries that have to make all these kinds of decisions and many places don't have those positions in place or the ones that do, because we all know about the difference between what's written in your job description and what you're actually able to do in a given culture or environment. 
um, they have um, job descriptions created without the full understanding of exactly how much cross-departmental agency we need in order to do the work of realignment. And I know Brandon has a question uh, about this later, so I'll get into that more. You know, and as, as you, know, you mentioned earlier, we've known about the resource sustainability crisis for decades. Uh, COVID is just one of many accelerants that could have that could have brought it to light. So if we're in positions of power, um, if we're in the folks on the call who are in positions like Chris, like John's, like Brandon's, um, and we're not used to granting that agency uh, to our workers, no matter where that feeling comes from, we're going to have to shift our idea of what's possible at that level. And I think that's going to be quite a task for some organization. It's also why I'd rather cut resources than people because I can get the stuff back. I can always get the stuff back, um, but I can't get lines back once they're gone. It's incredibly difficult. And if I have to pick, you know, but, but if we look at everything we incentivize, we look at things like ARL statistics, we look at how we gather and how we communicate assessment and impact, a lot of it is stuff focused. And that has also come out in uh, University of Michigan's recent assessment of, of how they were doing in terms of their library system and, and COVID. Most of the comments, regardless of where the comment is coming from, student, staff, faculty, staff, researcher, adjunct, full-time, you know, whatever, it's, it's all stuff oriented. And so I find that, um, I find that very curious and I wonder, um, and, and surely that will be duplicated throughout as we get other kinds of, of that um, data back, that there is that association when really it's about all of the services that we are capable of building, all of the structures um, and conversations that we're capable of facilitating and having. And so that's kind of where where my role maybe is on the panel is the person who gets kind of here are the values, how do they play out? But I'll talk about that more when Brandon asks about alignment and the work that GVSU has done. Awesome. Thanks so much, Scarlett. And so Caitlin, I'll turn to you for your big picture. And I want to weave in a question that we've gotten, uh, which um, was our first question pointing out, you know, there's a certain big research vibe happening on the panel right now. And uh, Caitlin, I'm guessing you've spoken to a variety of different kinds of institutions. So perhaps as part of your answer, you could import some of what you've heard in those conversations as well. Yeah, you bet. And and huge thanks again. It's a a big, a big step to take the stance after the three of you have all spoken. I think there's been a lot of topics here that I'm really curious to be able to dig into a little bit more. Um, and so, you know, to your initial question, Brandon, about how this has sort of affected our work and perspectives and what have you I mean, invest in open infrastructure was an idea and a coalition that came out of an event back in um, summer of 2018 that really picked up steam uh, over the course of not only these past few months, but I formally joined when New York City, where I live, went into lockdown. And so really kind of thrown into the midst of this during one of the greatest economic crises of our lifetime. Um, also where we're seeing this sort of tension of the perpetual doing more with less, but really like with that perceived scarcity, as well as a, a heightened demand and call for openness uh, for content, for resources, for research, for scholarship. And so what we exist to improve the funding and resourcing for the open technology and systems that we rely on, which you know many of the panelists have spoken a bit about, but also operating at this in this space where um, we are aiming to help shed some light on what the actual costs underlying these and what are the models and how we can move towards coordinated action. Because um, I do think that, and I know part of the questions here are around not only the kind of racial elements and um, all of that sort of upheaval that, you know, Chris and John have all spoken about. But to me, it's about how can we kind of break open that power structure where those conversations are really held by a chosen few. You know, what can we do to help increase the transparency for, you know, what sort of costs are, uh, are you know, exist in these broader systems and, and where investments in this work can help really advance the broader, broader system, but also recognizing that we're not only operating in a matter of, you know, a funding crisis, there's also a reallocation shock when it comes to the ways in which we resource these open projects um, and the underlying infrastructure that makes this vision possible. Uh, there are not only issues when it comes to who can participate, but also in terms of the staffing and the hiring freezes. These are some of the areas that we're digging into with these, you know, 95 participants for this research effort. 
And so I'm really fascinated to not only dig into matters of sustainability, I know there's been a question about how to reallocate budgets. Um, I envision a world where we can more closely couple some of the cancellations of these big deals or decisions that help you know, free up some of these budgets with plans that we can use to help make sure that that's being not just sucked up by austerity measures within the broader university, which we've heard from a number of university leaders, um, but also can then really help fund the vision that we're looking for across all these various areas. So um, those are those are some of the areas I'm really keen to dig into a little bit more. And I think we are going to see increased scrutiny as well as uh, a coming together of various organizations to start looking at where are their best practices from mapping these um, values-based and uh, mission-aligned criteria to how we're looking at budgets and expenditure. Um, Brandon, to your question and the question that was posed about the big research institutions versus others, um, probably one of the more interesting things I've uh, been hearing lately from some of our participants that are coming from uh, state and community colleges, but also from land grant institutions is what the difference in terms of the justification and, and mapping to one's mission of their organization, how that affects the culture of how decision making happens um, across various departments, not only within the library, but more broadly across the institution. And it's, it's really interesting to start comparing at that level as to what that means when it comes to instilling that into the way that the um, you know, folks are approaching these these really stressful times and these strains on the system. So happy to dig into a little bit more on the questions, but my thanks again. Perfect. Thanks, Caitlin. So, uh, so we got we got big, we got big picture, um, we got conceptual, but uh, let's get nitty gritty. And we've already got lots of questions about nitty gritty stuff too. So we'll see if we can weave those in. Um, I wanted to start getting uh, specific and ask uh, the folks that have gone through some realignment activities already, right, who have shifted the, uh, the ways that you're uh, evaluating the deals that you're making, and you've made some decisions based on that reevaluation. If you could tell us a little bit about the specific experience that you've had, um, and uh, uh, in particular, I'm curious, you know, how did values on one hand and sort of budget pressures on the other interact? Were you able to line those up and make them fuel one another? Or did you have to do some jujitsu to dodge one and make the other one do the work? Or, you know, how do those things work together for you when you're really doing the thing, when you're trying to shift the ground? And uh, I'll also ask if you can, specifically, a someone's asked, you know, look, the collections budget can be kind of sacrosanct and only for collections. And how, do you, does anyone have experience moving money from buckets to bucket and, and making that work and justifying that kind of a move? Um, and this time, if it's okay, why uh, can I start with John and then I'll go back uh, over to Scarlett and then to Chris. Yeah, I think um, when this really was, I was confronted with this issue, we known we've had this problem in our field for a long, long time. And I was confronted by it when I asked our procurement people to kind of get involved with our negotiations because we're, we're really at a stall, stall, stalling point with them. And the, the, when they came back, they, they said, you know, we've never seen anything like this. We've never seen this, uh, this aggressive type of sales um, pitch and, and it really is an unfair environment. And the minute they said that, I really had to begin to think, okay, where can I, where can I think about the collections and how can I think about that differently? And then how can I lead the team to think about how we think about collections differently? And we, um, we were really making some decisions without good data. I, I really try to stress that all the time, but in this case, uh, sometimes the data wasn't, wasn't presented. And the, the, the vendors in particular will tell you because they controlled all the, all the data, um, they would tell you, well, if you, if you do that, if you make that decision, the, the, the individual costs for the access to that article will be so high that it'll basically bust the budget. Or, you know, you'll, you'll need to figure out how you can make sure that faculty have access to this. These are all the things that I was hearing back in 2016. 
And we actually got out of one of those deals and we found that really um, it went from 300,000 to like $400 in the, in the usage. So it was just like mind boggling. Like how could it go from that amount of money to that smaller amount of money. But I think that's what my point is, is about fear and, and all the things that stop us from being like the first or going ahead of other people, or, you know, the vendors can say, well, you know, you really don't want to be out of step with your other colleagues and all of this other stuff. And, and I, I really had got to the point where I, I, I didn't think that that was an acceptable answer. And I, I, I you know, I took a risk, we, we took a risk and we, we ended up, it, it, it worked out okay. Um, and that's, that's my, I think my point to everyone is that it will work out okay. <laughs> and some people have gone all the way to individual titles. And so now it's more of a discussion about, okay, I'm not interested in Harmon necessarily. Uh, the, the business models have not been good, but we have um, this amount of money that we spend in our in our field, and can we can we just think a little bit more holistically about um, about how we do this, how we do our work, and how we bring our value? Um, I think I think that's really the point. And and to to the uh, to the question about work, Brandon, uh, I will just say that uh, I, I've been working harder uh, actually than I did before the pandemic, and and I think all of us have. And, 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 and that's an important point, just to say that it's, it's really time that we kind of step back and think about not bringing these old models of what we've done in the past to this new context. That's really, really important. I can't say that enough, but it's, it's gonna be really, really difficult to, to kind of do that because we're still at the same time getting calls from vendors, same kind of calls, right? So, uh, that, that's how I would answer that, that question. I hope I did. I hope I had set you up pretty well for that. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, John. And so I'll, I'll, turn to, I'll turn to Chris if you want to say a little bit about your experiences going through a kind of alignment, uh, specific alignment uh, activity and, and how budgets and values interact in that, in that uh, ex exercise. Sure. And Thanks, Brendan, and thanks, thanks, John. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll speak from two examples from MIT that worked at MIT, and um, you know, to the extent it, that it's helpful to other places to share them, so you can adapt them to your uh, own uh, institution. That's great. Um, but I fully realize that what works at MIT may or may not work elsewhere, right? Um, but, but two examples that come to mind on this question of sort of how do you align your investments and your, your, you know, your money with your values, right? And uh, I can't really take credit for either of them. So the, the first example is um, uh, many of you know that Greg Yao, who was the AD for collections here at MIT uh, for a couple of years before he became uh, president of CRL, um, he came to me after he'd been at MIT for about six months and he walked into my office and he says, I have a really kind of wild idea. It might be a really bad idea. Can I, can I share it with you? I, I'm a sucker for bad ideas. So uh, I said, sure, go ahead. And uh, essentially his idea was to, to take our scholarly communications unit and our collections uh, unit and not just combine them, which I think is also a very good idea, but actually move the collections budget and the collection strategist and the collection spending under scholarly communications. And what he said is, you know, we say that our values prioritize open and prioritize transforming the scholarly communication system, but we've got a collections department over here that's at time, certainly working um, orthogonally to uh, SCALCOM, but at times actually working in opposition. Let's bring them together and put the thing that we say is our priority in charge. And I said, that is kind of a wild idea. <laughs> so let me sleep on it and we'll both see if we think it's a good idea in the morning. And the next morning we both said, that's a great idea, let's do it. And we did. Um, and 
it's made a huge difference both within the library and in the way that we talk across the campus about we don't we don't talk as much about collections as we do about scholarly communications um and it has it has that impact for us of um, scholarly communications and how do we transform scholarly communications both locally and as much impact as we can possibly have um, globally towards something that is more open and more equitable. That is the umbrella under which all of our decisions, even in collections, we try to make. I mean, I'm not saying all of them are made that way, of course, but you know, when we, when we sort of have the time to stop and think and sort of test decisions through a rubric, that's the rubric we're able to test it through. Um, the other example is what Brandon uh, alluded to earlier, um, which is the MIT framework. Um, and so uh, we had an open access task force at MIT um, that ran, I don't know, it feels like a decade ago, but I think it was only two years ago, two and a, a year and a half ago. Um, and in the course of conversations that we hosted across campus during um, during the course of that, the work that that task force did, um, it became clear that there were some common themes and some shared values across the institute, right? That faculty, graduate students, undergrads, postdocs, there were some shared values around open science, um, not universally shared by any stretch, but some common themes and some sort of implicit beliefs and values and ideas um, that people were sort of crying out to be made explicit, right? And so that's really um, what the framework did, right? So a group of us in the libraries, we worked with the faculty committee on the libraries, we worked with members of the open access task force who were many, many faculty from various disciplines, um, even some key members of the MIT libraries uh, visiting committee, one of whom's on this call, um, we worked to develop a, a document that would express sort of the key elements of our ideal value driven model of what a contract with a scholarly publisher would be. And that framework is based on the assertion that the value um, in published scholarship originates in the labor of authors and peer reviewers and editors and the institutions that support them. Um, it's also based on the idea that that um, the benefit to society is greatest when scholarship is freely and immediately available to everyone. Um, and that many scholars still value some of the services that are provided by journals and journals publishers, but that institutions should pay only for those services that are valued and are value add rather than paying monopoly rent for the content that we create. Um, so those developing that framework, which then, as Brandon said, um, we've been very fortunate that it resonated throughout the community and we have over 100 uh, institutions that have endorsed that framework. Um, that framework is an expression of our values and we've been applying it in negotiations with uh, publishers um, for six months or more now. Um, and then just a structural change that we were able to make. Um, those are two big examples of ways that we've tried to align our values um, in very real and consequential ways. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, that's one way to make the buckets line up. Uh, put one bucket inside the other one. <laughs> I like it. Um, so Scarlett, uh, I wonder if you wanted to add some of your experiences working on these kinds of issues, you know, in the details. What what have you what would you take away from those stories and tell us a little bit of the story while you're at it? Sure. Um, if so your dogs will let you. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say they right on cue have decided to get quite vocal. Um, so uh, there's first my my first sort of job uh, when I got to Grand Valley was uh, really to be able to sit down with both our head of collections and digital scholarship and also um, the dean of libraries and say we need to be able to uh, understand and articulate. Uh, to all of the campus stakeholders, uh, what are conditions that we'll recognize is something that we need to walk away from in terms of a uh, negotiation or a contract or um, whatever it is that that we're looking at. Um, and second is that we'll need to uh, align library values to, to specific clauses within contracts and figure out how, how operationally our values actually playing out because we can all write 
everybody on this call can write a mission vision value statement um, for wherever it is that they work. Um, but how that plays out in the day to day is what my my job is and, and how that actually works. So um, so for Grand Valley State University Libraries alignment has meant not just looking at programs are emerging that need investment, but how the library is operating value claims play out in our license agreements and supply chains. And so without getting into what could be a whole other workshop um, on that process, the, um, the, la the point I'll make is that the, the work I have been able to do, uh, in particular, uh, Brandon mentioned the reusing and modifying uh, University of Guelph's textbook statement uh, and looking at uh, creating local deal breakers for, uh, for uh, contract negotiation, which are really similar to MIT's uh, journal framework and also work out of Syracuse libraries um, and saying, here's here are kind of the conditions of access that we want. You can't just charge us more because you've made it more accessible. That's a bare minimum uh, for entry uh, into the higher end market and it doesn't involve more money uh, on our part. Th those kinds of things. Um, uh, all of that has been possible because of the environment that my supervisor and that the dean's office has created, and that's the conditions for me to flourish and succeed with those kinds of with those kinds of ideas. The conditions that Chris was just talking about about letting somebody come in the office with what sounded like on its surface of unusual idea, when that's kind of been the model that we've seen a lot of, um, in particular, academic libraries uh, cross through uh, lately. Uh, those conditions, that, that trust and that energy that, no, we're going to trust you to do a good job, um, so go ahead and make it happen. Those conditions meant that I could um, modify University of Guelph statement, release it with a pretty quick turnaround, and we've watched as at least a dozen libraries all over uh, the United States have done the same. Uh, libraries have gotten so good at connecting people with resources as a profession that we've vanished the problem and our own labor besides. So as, as traumatic as some of some cuts will be perceived, it's time for all of those discussions to run in parallel and all of the panelists have talked about that, that sustainable scholarly communications isn't the work of one department. It's a deliberate move on the part of institutions every day. We have to choose it every day in spite of persistent jeopardy and relentless kind of unknowns uh, in terms of what might happen if we do something. Um, the most, I think the most striking thing too, since, since Chris brought it up, about um, walking away from, from a contract and, and from cancellations in general at places like MIT or University of California or the SUNY system, uh, isn't that they happened because we've known about those problems for so long, it's that those institutions that I've just named gave Elsevier the clearest possible conditions for which a business relationship would be maintained because that's the other thing. It's a, it's a business relationship and the content provider didn't meet them. So, you know, you tell me who's out of alignment when we're talking about um, values and how they play out and where they might work because we've had, we've had all of, all of the before time <laughs> um, before all this happened to make this relationship work and consistently we see one side coming to the table articulating a new idea and the and the provider generally wanting to keep things status quo so um i'm not sure uh, necessarily if that um let's see i'm hearing an update the Guelph statement has been used by more than 80 schools globally uh we were surprised by the traction it got uh, so so paul is here he's one of the authors uh, there's probably a few other folks who helped author that statement as well. Um, so that's that's where I think that comes from. Um, what that actually looks like on the ground, I have a link to what mapping the standards-driven license agreement comes from. Uh, one of the conversations I've had with the, with the panelist group earlier is, and I'll drop this into the chat for folks to have if they would like, and this is just how this plays out at GVSU. If you want to talk about how it might work at your institution, we can do that. Um, and that's that uh, every, everything that we everything that we say that we value has a clause that it applies to in in a resource agreement. And so figuring out how to make that work on the ground is, is where we're gonna be able to engage a lot of those conversations. But the only way that we can do that effectively is by being able to walk away and say, say no. I, I don't like to frame a pandemic as an opportunity, but we do have a moment here where we can say, this is a business relationship, it's no longer working for us. Um, and 
you know, some of some of the other ways this plays out on the ground, since I've heard mention of interdisciplinary uh, stuff, I'm, I'm at the teaching institution on the panel. So um, I'll bring it up here. If we're looking at things like journal impact factor, which again, a whole other webinar on the complexities of that and whether or not it's even a useful metric anymore, um, sort of the economies of prestige, this stuff only costs so much because we've paid for it. Um, you know, we, we determine, you know, that, that, kind of, that kind of market and, um, you know, getting really being able to get at different metrics. And I invoked assessment earlier too, because how we measure and what we measure is, is ultimately going to determine whether or not we fail or, or succeed here. We're essentially a not capitalist enterprise operating under a capitalist umbrella, right? This is, um, libraries are sort of perceived as this giant resource sink, you know, in the same way that the postal service is. Like, no, it's a service. It's something that you provide. It's exactly the same series of arguments. So it's interesting to watch it play out in another um, provider system. But that's what, um, that's what it looks like here. Um, Here's the UC, someone has, le has left in chat the um, UC statement from the faculty that creates that clarity endorsed by the Academic Senate. So certainly if you have shared governance opportunities within your, um, or boards of, you know, boards of whatever, if you're a, you know, in public libraries or something, um, how, how making that work and actually, you know, kind of receiving the blessing. Not that you have to ask anybody's permission to do this, they're your contracts, but, uh, you know, certainly getting, getting stakeholder buy-in helps. But again, none of that would be possible without a, uh, without a supportive work environment and people who wanted to watch us this work and happen. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Scarlett. Um, and so now, Caitlin, I want to do a twist on this question for you um, because you've been talking to a lot of people. And so I wonder if we can, I apologize for my dog, I wonder if we can... Um, if we can ask you to give us a sneak peek at some of what the stories you're hearing um, at whatever level of abstraction you're comfortable talking about those, but some specifics that are coming out of what you're learning. Sure. Um, first off, John, I saw that you had unmuted. Did you want to add a comment to Scarlett before I jump in? Yeah, I, I'll wait until after you get finished. I think it's good to just go sure? through it. Yeah, no, no, no. It's, it's a universal point, I'm, I, I guarantee you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so Brandon, some of the some of the conversations and we are in the process of uh, analyzing about 85 to 90 interviews over the last seven weeks um, from not only those within institutions at varying levels of uh, varying levels of not only budgetary oversight, but also involvement in this process, library representation, um, other supporting organizations, and also those that are from um, different areas of scholarship from governance on preprint services to otherwise. Um, some of the things that we've been, I've been especially listening to are where there could be potential models we can bring forth as interventions for broader discussion in the group, um, knowing that the coordination is a big element um, and thinking through some of the values driven uh, application that we're seeing in various places. And I know we've heard a couple of these examples, what that looks like um, but also where there are still potentially gaps. Um, I think one of the big misconceptions, um, or at least something that we're continually up against, given that we have invest in our name uh, for invest in open infrastructure, is the idea that more money will fix everything. Um, and as we've seen in the questions, this is also an issue around staffing, around resourcing, around other sorts of elements that um, we need to take into consideration, as well as you know, what it looks like for broader coordination and um, collaboration across many of the services and, and pieces of infrastructure that we're, we're looking at. Um, I know our focus is specifically on the open technology and systems, but there are these broader questions that I think bringing in some of the um, models that we're hearing and they range from allocating portions of collections budgets, uh, which I know there have been a couple of questions about, portions of collections budgets, uh, you know, whether it's one, 2% um, to invest in open um, to, you know, areas where we really need to shift from, you know, less of trying to uh, think of it as, you know, how much spend have we already had out the door thinking retroactively about the money that's being allocated to thinking more proactively about what um, investing in these things to help make them more resilient, what that can look like. And so um, we've heard everything from where more centralized, as Chris was saying, more centralized um, budgetary 
oversight for the libraries. I know Iowa State is a great example of this where um, decisions are just, they happen at a different level based on how the library budget is um, managed and, and, and is allocated. Uh, to other areas where, you know, across broader systems, there can be different economies of scale that can help be achieved. Um, some of the things I've been especially interested in and in kind of gathering as much information as possible are where um, these value statements that are crafted at an institutional level or borrowed from another institution and mapped to the mission to help with the case making for um, those budgetary decisions, how those are applied. Um, because I know that when we talk about open infrastructure, you know, there's often a, a short list of, is it open source? Is it open data? Is it open content? But I'm curious as to where that leads to evoking trust, be able to scale something within an institution, what that looks like from all different dimensions, which is where it gets a little bit more complicated. And then also what the trade-offs are. Um, I know in the uh, opening remarks, there was a conversation or the point about trading off convenience for access, um, you know, thinking through where we're trading off, you know, an invoice relationship for data about our users, where that might lead to surveillance or research intelligence, um, where it locks us into a three year deal where prices may continue to increase. Um, everyone has their own risk, uh, risk profile for that and their own, um, I guess, threshold for change and threshold for top like in, in terms of tolerance uh, we are really keen to see where we can start to bring those conversation elements together as well as talk about that framing in a way as if we are operating in a business arrangement because that is what we're doing but uh one that's in more of a robin hood sort of way destined to move towards good outcomes so you know when it comes to the case making that we've seen vendors employ that has been successful with top level administrators, where can we wield that sword towards good? Um, and so those are the stories that we're, we're starting to gather as well as the concrete data points about the justifications that are happening in a real day-to-day -day, um, applied fashion to take this out of the theoretical and into really direct action. And so we will have more to share out in the next few weeks as well for that. I'm excited to circulate with this group. Yeah, Brandon, if I could, I just wanted to intersect a couple points that Scarlett made and also one uh, to say something about the example that Chris shared. It's not a bad idea if a leader actually listens to the idea and really thinks about it and then empowers people to do it. And that's how ideas come, come about. And this particular time is really important because we've seen more change in our maybe our institutions, our society than we've ever seen in the last six months. I, I, I mean, honestly, I've been surprised by the kinds of ways that people have stepped up to work uh, in an online environment for faculty and the way librarians have come to work in an online environment. Uh, so I, I think what I really want to say on, on this point is that if leadership is not just for people in the positions that Chris and I hold. Leadership is actually, uh, it's a station that everyone in the library can have. And I would just empower everyone to think about that agency of leadership that you might have to influence the direction of an organization where you might not have seen it before, or you might have been told no more. I can tell you, people tell me no quite a lot. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm pretty hardy for no's. Uh, so, really try to get to leadership. And I'm going to tell you one story that makes this really more imperative. I was at a, a, a big convention of library directors, and it was maybe in 2014 or 15 that we were all kind of grousing about the inflationary increases and, you know, just like library directors talk about this thing, believe it or not. And, um, uh, you know, at the end, a senior member, a very respected member of our community got up and he said, you know, colleagues, um, I just want you to know as you're thinking about these ideas to make changes in our complex ecosystem that you have to remember that your retirement invests in these, uh, these vendor companies. Okay, now that, that, was like, that was like mind blowing to me because I'm gonna be in this field for another 20 years. Dang, you know, I, I need to figure out how we can work together and come up with solutions. And I don't, and, and 
And oh, by the way, when he got done saying that, you could look across the room and there was no discussion of change or thinking about doing things differently or anything from that group because you look around and it's all people who could be three to five years from retirement. We heard that in 2008, but anyway, uh, maybe we might be closer to that. And so as we get new leaders coming in, I think it's important for people at various levels of the organization to influence change and to expect that decisions will be made differently. Um, so I just wanted to make a point of, about Scarlett's point, but also to recognize that process that you go through as a leader to hear an idea, even if you think it's a bad one, uh, how, how do you orientate yourself to it and how can you create an environment where it's not just that idea, but it's many ideas. We're going to have to have an environment where we start thinking about new ways of doing things a lot. It's not one idea. It's not like we're going to get done in six months and then try another idea. And then it's not like that anymore. Uh, and it won't be like that. It'll be a little bit faster and we have to be a little bit more courageous, but it does boil down to leadership. And I didn't want that point to go uh, missing. Scarlett, did you want to jump in real quick? I thought you had a response. Yeah, just, just because there's a number of questions that have come up and a couple of things in chat. Um, someone uh, has asked about, a number of people have asked about how do we communicate uh, a number of these sort of problems to faculty. There's a, a particularly rich moment now with the sheer number of resources that have become free for COVID. Um, either these sort of curated pages or things like that, and we're having to kind of go through the weeds and, and untangle some of this, especially if we adopted large numbers of things that were free and are now paywalled that are sitting in catalogs. Um, just the incredible number of content provider collections that suddenly dropped their paywalls about public health or vaccines or epidemiology and um, the a uh, huge correlation we see between um, uh, racial disparities and outcomes and particularly particularly with COVID. I'm sorry, my old medical librarian hat is turning on for a second and I'll put it away. Um, at some point you have to admit that not investing in open slows progress and that we know that it hurts patient care um, in some way and all of these kinds of outcomes. And if there is an opportunity here, and I, I still feel that that word is a little cringy when we're talking about the death of 170,000 people just in this country alone, um, as so many people have told me that it is, it's one that must refuse to continue as usual, as loudly and as, as unified as we can. Crisis shows us known information in new contexts. And what it does, I, I think right now, all of the things that we were talking about, reveals who was and was not aware of existing inequalities, structural problems, and all of the sort of invisible labor that maintains illusions of stability on their behalf. We're gonna shelter a certain level from all of what's going on um, as, a, as a method of protection and also because we wanna have some level of, of, of agency in that I'm gonna clean up this before I send it to you. I'll get you a one pager. We don't necessarily have the time to go in and explain to you, you know, how e-resources works and the incredibly untenable number of resources that and platforms that we use to just to manage, you know, that kind of invisibility. I think reading a crisis like and crises like the one that we're experiencing is a skill, right? It's the difference between looking and seeing. And that's what I need. I, I can lead as much as I want, but that's broadly in libraries what I need leaders to do. Thanks, Scarlett. Uh, that's oh, that's good. I like that. Looking and seeing is a great is a great way to put it. So I wanted to ask because this is uh, coming up a lot in the uh, in the Q and A. There've been a couple of passionate mentions of this, and it tags on to a nice thread that we had hoped to try to get to, which is engaging with our own fellow librarians about these changes. Right? How do we um, uh, how do we get folks to understand and feel comfortable, or how do we address very valid and reasonable fears um, and build consensus within our institutions in favor of the kinds of realignments that we might be trying to, to make happen? And, and in the process, how do we look out for the well-being of those staff members and you know, uh, enact the value that we have for them as a part of that alignment, right? We value 
um, the labor that folks do in libraries. So how, how do we align in favor of that value? Um, to try to paraphrase some really great uh, questions that we've had in the chat so far. Um, so I wonder if, if anyone, want, if y'all want to start to comment on that, maybe um, I'll go back uh, to Chris first and then um, we'll make our way around. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to comment on that and uh, try to tie some things together, but I'm not sure if I'll be able to. Um, so, you know, I, I are, and I want to answer one of the other questions, which was about how some um, area studies and other folks have, have expressed some concerns about, you know, sort of a digital first response to the current crisis, um, which, of course, then ends up sort of disadvantaging and maybe even reinscribing some inequalities across disciplines where their resources are not available digitally and also you know someone else brought up broadband issues which is another kind of inequality right so digital first is not some panacea that's going to solve inequality um, and i think it does um, help us see that those are the inequalities we should then be be focusing on, right? Instead of using, oh, we'll, we'll buy all these books then to, for this group or for this, these folks, the, you know, it, it's, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think there are a number of ways, and I'm not gonna say it as eloquently as Scarlett did, but where this current crisis sort of forces us to look at the heart of, of the problems that we, um, you know, Band-Aid over is, is the phrase that I'm, I'm going to use again, even though there's probably a better one. Um, so, for example, you know, uh, we have students who can't afford to buy all the textbooks that are required for their course. So we let them borrow them for two hours at the library. Like, that is not an answer. <laughs> like, that is a panacea. That is, a you know, like, we shouldn't be doing that. We should be looking at, like, why do textbooks cost so much? Why are, why are we assigning textbooks that are $300 a person, right? We should be looking at other answers, right? Um, and this, uh, I think I lost my train of thought there. Um, that's an issue. There's another, um, there's something else I was going to say about, <sighs> sorry, I totally lost my train of thought there because I get really worked up about this whole reserves being an answer to, to anything. Um, and I'm going to answer a question that's not part of what you answered, but I think is important. Someone somewhere in one of the questions um, asked about cost transparency with our communities, right? Um, and that was a big part of our strategy in getting um, the community um, to buy into the framework um, and to um, sign on and be behind us sort of standing firm on the framework as we negotiated with, um, um, with various publishers, including Elsevier, right? And so, for example, one of the uh, uh, data points that I shared with our faculty was that, um, you know, given our cost for our Elsevier contract and our number of uses, et cetera, et cetera, like it came out roughly to about 30 bucks an article that we're paying for Elsevier. For Archive, we're one of the top subscribers. We, we pay $10,000 a year that means that we're paying about two cents a download, right? And when you look at that and you're talking to folks who actually make heavy use of archive and, you know, can, the, it doesn't make sense to them why um, that difference in cost is there. And, and they just don't know it. I mean, that's not what our faculty aren't supposed to be experts in how much things cost, right? But we have to bring them into the conversation if we want them behind us. So, totally lost the thread on the rest of the question. So I'm going to let someone else talk and maybe I'll get the thread back. <laughs> it's all right. There's, um, you know, one of the, one of the conversations I've had uh, earlier, I talked about, you know, kind of the old standby metric is cost per use, you know, one of the, and, and, you know, we have kind of a, a, a value that's been instilled here that, you know, we have a student centered, you know, we have a student centered library. I've invited different conversations about both of those. One is that, I want to know how you used it because there's a huge difference between I published somewhere and here are the 15 things I cited to get to that place, especially if we're talking about early career scholarship. How did you get there? 
guess what? I have a shiny IR, also owned by Elsevier, that you can put your, you know, preprint and postprint copy in, and here's a profile we can develop to, you know, make sure that your scholarship gets out there and disseminated, but I'm more interested in buying everything that you cited, especially when we talk about um, uh, the, the innovation in, in universities comes from those interdisciplinary programs. If we cut things that have, you know, low use, but I cited it five times, and I just downloaded the one article. We have to, we have to really look at exactly what's happening and how our collections are being animated in order to, in order to answer, answer some of those questions and also to kind of maintain the conditions for innovation that are that are going to be possible. Um, the uh, we just we just have to recognize that for for what it is. John or Caitlin, uh, do you have anything to say on this question of like? Uh, Aligning our values in favor of our coworkers, in some sense, right, and 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 alleviating their fears and concerns, and and bringing them into the conversation in the right way when we're when we're making these changes. Yeah, it's a very very difficult conversation, which is why I started out with fear and really the courage to think through some of these ideas that we might be able to try, because when you hear an idea, it's gonna it's gonna sound like the worst or a bad idea. Like Chris said, it, it's not gonna it's not gonna seem like it's it's where we should go. Which is why we also should think about measure measuring uh, the work that we do, and can we think about uh, tying our work really succinctly and in measurable ways to student success? For example, my institution has really uh, seen a lot of retention of students at various levels, uh, and and seen the greatest gains uh, from a very paltry 26 percent. Uh, now it's going to be over 50 percent in less than seven years. Now they had to do a lot of work on the campus to kind of begin to restructure how the student interaction and student experience works. And when I was hired in 2017, one of the questions that the provost asked was, how can the library be involved in student success and retention? And that's actually a really hard question for us because we haven't really, we haven't really been asked that question. We provide our services, we provide our collections, um, but we don't ever tie back to how did those answers or how did those collections really lend themselves to the eventual student success? Or higher than that, can we say that our work really was central to the whole of student experience while they were there? Or higher than that, can we say that we, we're going to be involved to helping students during a pandemic who didn't get a chance to finish their academic careers in high school, that maybe there's some things that we can do to begin to prepare them for college when they come in. But then we put a lot of pressure on ourselves, I think, to uh, get it right in the four years. And I, I try to tell the group that I'm with that's very creative that, look, maybe, maybe we don't think about this in terms of just the four years, but what, what, what does higher education mean for our alumni? And couldn't we have a relationship with them as a library to help them change careers? I think I read an article about uh, people changing careers 16 times. Now, Chris and I probably changed jobs that many times, but we've done it in the same career. I can't imagine trying to think about how does one evaluate their influence and passion for a new career. And so how, how could they do that? And I also know that we have set up, you know, the ways that people would come ask us these questions, we've seen the de decline of those reference desk questions. But I, I'm more positive and I say that that doesn't mean the questions are not there. It just means that the way we've set up our shingle to help people is uh, really the challenge. So. I would say to colleagues that are really, really accustomed to the way that things are, just ask yourself, you know, wh why, do I, why do I think it has to be this way? And during a pandemic, uh, we, as, as I said, we've seen a lot of change. There's been a lot of change. Faculty who for a long time at my institution and many institutions I worked at said they would never teach online. That's just not the way that higher education is, that's not the way it rolls. And yet they, they, they were able to do that in, in some institutions less than a week, some institutions two weeks, you know. So I, I think that change can happen. It's like 
it's like, what do we believe we can accomplish as a profession, as a group of people on an institution level? And I, I'm here to say that we can accomplish more than we believe we can. And sometimes the limitations that we put around ourselves are what makes it really challenging. So I would say to the people that are really trying to get your colleagues to change, really just stay at it and be respectful of what they see, but also be really insistent that you really should try, try new things because you don't actually know if it's gonna work and that if you set up metrics to show eventually some data, some, 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 some ways that you can prove that this might be a good way to work um, is also really good. And, and having that larger philosophical discussion about values is really, really important. And I think our profession is beginning to think about how to have those discussions and not be a total reductionist type of, type of conversation where it reduced down to some puddle that we can't even uh, think our way out of. So I think it's really important that we stay positive and that we recognize that this is, this is our work going forward and definitely in the next three to four years, but it's our work for our profession as we think about how to bring our, our, our value and demonstrate that to our institutions. Thanks, John. Um, so I, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time and um, it would be, it would be a, a grave mistake if we didn't get a chance to talk a little bit about the response to the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, and the racial justice conversations that have been started uh, in part as a result of those events. Um, you know, addressing these issues within libraries and within the academic community is, uh, you know, an overdue and huge task. And of course, there's, there's you know, uh, dozens and dozens of different conversations we could have about this, but keeping in mind our purview, right? I'm curious what impact those events have had on the way you think about scholarly communication in this context. Is there, are there ways that we need to change the way we think about um, the resources we obtain and the, and the positions we create and the infrastructure we buy in connection with alleviating this long running injustice? And I'll throw that open. Scarlett, you're unmuted, so maybe I'll let you talk if you Yeah, uh, sure. Um, because definitely what conversations on racial justice need is more voices from white women. Uh, but I uh, will uh, mention some kind of, some kind of ref reflections there. I'm just, I, I'm giving Brandon a hard time because I admire him a lot. But um, I, this is, this is tied to kind of the things that sort of band-aids and things that we're talking about. And I have seen so many institutions start to um, promote uh, open and reusable educational resources as uh, a solution. But the fact is, is that those are in particular containers that we define as scholarly or we um, insist that um, resources that are scholarly look and feel a particular way. Um, and we talk about open open education and, and open knowledges like they're new things. And really it's just that they're new to white people. Um, when we know that black people, that indigenous communities, that other marginalized um, groups have had methods of open um, communications within their, within their communities for hundreds of years. Um, and that we now want to sort of go out and acquire this and put it in a container that we're deciding is scholarly. Um, so I agree that open is, is good. Um, the, the amount of, of moralizing that can occur uncritically around it is what I'm sort of concerned about. And so as there are um, more um, institutional movements to try and um, to try and address this, I mean, because I, we, we bought Sophia Noble's book, we bought Roe Benjamin's, you know, we, we've got all, all of that stuff there, but there's a difference between buying something and having it sit and then promoting it and having it mapped and integrated into curriculums. How do we teach it? Um, how do we, you know, engage with that stuff? And that just because knowledge exists, you know, within a community that we're interested in, in um, you know, preserving knowledge or information doesn't mean I have any right or, or entitlement to, to come in and take it. Um, we see this all the time with grant funded applications that get funded in communities. I'm gonna go study this. No, you're not. You're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna engage in some weird surveillance so that you can preserve you know, something that isn't yours and doesn't belong to you. And so I think that um, you know, that kind of, of 
of careful um, critique of um, of knowledges that have existed outside of containers that colonial methodologies consider scholarly. So as we build these things, as we build infrastructure, um, I'm going to be looking for um, not just rep not just representation, but critique um, from those people and projects that actively resist classification and containment. In particular, as I've said, if we're going to suggest that open is inherently good, you know, we can document without causing harm, we have an obligation to interrogate the systems that we construct and the ones that exist for biases that exist there. And so that's where I'm at with incorporating racial justice in my work and what we do and how we might build in the future. It's, it's really hard to follow that because um, <laughs> that was pretty awesome. Um, so just like plus one to everything that Scarlett said. Um, but I want to tell just one really quick story, which is we've tried really hard to, when we talk about open scholarship, to actually say, talk about open and equitable scholarship. And then people always want to know, what do, what do you mean by open I get, equitable I don't get? So that allows us to have some conversations um, with members of our community. It also very recently opened up a uh, an opportunity where some graduate students at MIT um, were very troubled by uh, an upcoming Springer article in a Springer journal about facial recognition software and AI that would predict criminality. And they were really troubled by the fact that Springer was going to um, publish this article. Um, and so they were writing a letter to, you know, they were sort of banding together to um, write a letter and, and make some noise about it. And they thought to reach out to the library because they said, you guys talk about this stuff. You might be helpful. And we were. And so there's a success story there of um, building community. And it kind of ties into some of the other questions about our expertise being, um, you know, where does our expertise lie and how do we make sure that that is evident across the community? Thank you, Chris. Uh, Caitlin or John, do y'all have anything you'd like to add? Caitlin? I'll, I'll just quickly add that, um, so investment open infrastructure, we are very much anchored in funding, open technology, capitalism, sustainability, which is a long-term horizon. Um, each of those higher ed, all of those levels have, you know, built-in systemic inequities that we know about, right? And I think there's been some fantastic work over the while and I won't even just say the last few years, it has more so come to the forefront over the last few years, but has been percolating for quite some time about, you know, who's making these decisions, openness for who, um, also what are we, what are we locking in by making different funding recommendations? And so, you know, I, I took this job five months ago. Uh, we have a 20 person steering committee. Uh, there are some representatives on this call of that steering committee. Um, and we had a really open and frank conversation about the fact that if, you know, we need to hold ourselves to a higher standard if we are going to be in a position to advise funders and also institutional leaders about open technology, which by its very nature in many cases excludes others, and also be talking about funding, um, you know, investment and longer term horizons so that we are not exacerbating uh, and locking in additional inequities into what we have. So we are um, currently working with a consultant to help us stand up an anti-racist framework for our governance structure, just to make sure as a first step that we have the right representation around the table um, within the next few months uh, and continue to work towards building that into our process and everything that we do. I would just say quickly that uh, we're in a moment that's beyond statements now, that if you've written a statement that you really should think about how the specific actions that you're taking in the library to create this new equitable uh, environment uh, or culture in the library is really uh, moving things uh, down the line to be different. And we can all really welcome new people into this profession. I'm so impressed with the new people that we have BIPOC people of color that have come in and uh, to our profession and they're asking really good questions about what is going on in this profession and why isn't there more diverse folks here and why aren't there more opportunities for leadership uh, within, within the libraries. And so I would just encourage everyone to look uh, for, for those in your students and also people that you might hire in those positions as well so that we we, we can have a, 
library that really leads all the DEI efforts on the campuses in which we exist. And as, as Chris just mentioned, that we're a, a focal point for answers in, in the community as well. So I, I think we can do it. I think we can do it, but it requires us making some different decisions and they will be rather uncomfortable decisions. But uh, I, I think if you're making uncomfortable decisions, you know you're probably going in the right direction. That's really well said, John, and probably a great place for us to conclude. Um, you know, I think beyond statements is maybe that's 2020. That's the motto for 2020. We are beyond statements. Um, so thank you all for really a wonderful, uh, fascinating conversation. Thanks to the very active participants in the chat and the questions. Um, you all were fabulous. You know, we could do this all week. Uh, and I would, um, but you know, I, I, we all have all the things we have to run off and do. So we uh, really appreciate you. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks to Spark and ACRL for hosting and stay tuned y'all. It's gonna stay interesting for the foreseeable future. I guarantee you that. Everyone have a wonderful day, a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>